All right, so here we go with part three of part one of chapter 21. And um, before we get into the hereditary hemolytic anemias, let's first remind ourselves of what anemia is. All right, the physical, physiological manifestations of the disease is a reduced oxygen carrying capacity of the red blood cells. This could be due to uh, the red blood cells not being in the proper shape. It could be because the red blood cells lack the proper hemoglobin content. Um, it could be because red blood cells are being lost or being destroyed. And the clinical symptoms of anemia are going to be fatigue, weakness, dyspnea, and pallor because of the lack of oxygen getting to your tissues. So, with hereditary hemolytic anemia, there are four major categories. These type of anemias are going to be genetically determined, all right, and therefore hereditary. So, you can have abnormally shaped cells. You can have abnormal hemoglobins, defective hemoglobin synthesis, and then red cell enzyme deficiencies. All of these are going to have a genetic component, and a lot of them are going to be recessive, meaning you need two copies of the defective gene. But with the abnormal shaped cells, all right, the cells are going to get trapped in the spleen. They can get trapped in other areas of the body and then not be able to transport oxygen to the tissues. You can have abnormal hemoglobin. The big one for this is sickle cell anemia, which you will need to know about, and we'll talk about that on the next couple of slides. There can be defective hemoglobin synthesis. Um, the biggest one is thal thalassemia, and this could be alpha or beta. And generally, people who have this are going to have Greek or Italian ancestry. Then red cell enzyme deficiencies. <coughs> Excuse me. Different enzymes are going to be defective, and so therefore you're not going to have red blood cell um, development and proper function. So the biggest one, most common one worldwide, is probably going to be sickle cell anemia. Um, sickle cell anemia in terms of abnormal hemoglobins and then abnormally shaped cells would be the two most common worldwide. And with sickle cell anemia, we don't actually see it too often in the United States, but of these four, that would be the most common. And it's going to, it has a genetic component, and it's typically going to be seen more often in people with an African ancestor link, so African Americans. Um, it's seen a fair amount around the Mediterranean as well. And of course, in on the continent of Africa. <clears throat> so, with sickle cell anemia, there is a single amino acid change, and that's what show, is shown here in this bottom figure. Normal hemoglobin beta chain, the hemoglobin molecule is made of a beta and an alpha chain, and there should be a glutamic acid, but because of a point mutation in the DNA code, it creates a conversion from glutamic acid into a valine. And this is very important for proper folding of the hemoglobin. So the red blood cell does not have the proper shape as a result of the improper folding of the hemoglobin. Um, this condition actually makes people resistant to malaria. If you recall from micro, the organism plasmodium is going to infect red blood cells. The sickle cell shape of the red blood cells in sickle cell anemia prevent the plasmodium organism from actually getting into the red blood cell. Therefore, keeping or making a person with sickle cell anemia resistant to malaria. So while there can be complications due to sickle cell anemia, in some cases, very severe complications, this disease is actually protective against malaria. And so it's interesting that you find high incident of malaria on the continent of Africa. 
but you also have a high incident of sickle cell anemia. All right, so then the last slide of this part of Chapter 21 is just looking at diagnostic evaluation of anemia. Uh, you don't have anything in your notes because it's pretty um, straightforward in terms of what is right here on the slide. You're obviously going to take a history and do a physical examination of the person to look for uh, those four major symptoms. You can look at a complete blood count look at a blood smear to actually look at the physical characteristics of the red blood cells. You can do a reticulocyte count. All right, down here you've got that same figure of looking at the progression of red blood cell development. The reticulocyte count, all right, what happens if the factory is damaged? Then the red blood cells are not going to leave the bone marrow, and so you would have low numbers of reticulocytes. You can do a bone marrow study. Again, if you're worried, the physician is worried that the bone marrow, the factory, is the issue, you can take a biopsy or do a bone marrow study. If it's an issue of chronic blood loss, you can look for chronic blood loss from the GI tract, taking a stool sample, looking for uh, fresh blood, digested blood, and then looking at iron tests. All right, looking at the stores of iron, um, what amount of iron is being transported through the blood, look at serum, ferritin, and then just normal serum iron levels and serum iron binding capacity.